Well, hey, this morning, I, I am excited to get to be able to bring to you, share with you part three of an unexpected Christmas. And if you miss part one or two, I hope you will jump in. Go online, you can pick up part one or two. But this morning, I am going to start us with a question. All right, we're not going to put it on the screen yet. Because this is a deep theological question. And I think if we could answer this super deep, super spiritual, theological Christmas question, all of our Christmases would probably just be so smooth and would be perfect. Okay, so here's the question. The question is, when is it acceptable to begin listening to Christmas music? Right, is there anyone in the room who would say you are like a 365er? Like you never turned, look at that. I, you know, I thought you, y'all are amazing and you're calling out your spouse. You can deal with that later. Um, but you know what? Kudos to you. I, I thought nobody would raise their hand on that, right? I mean, how many other early adopters who would say we are pre-Halloween? Any pre-Halloweeners out there? You're like, we like to get it in then. I see a hand there. All right, I mean, now, now and we're, we're kind of narrowing it down to, to, you know, to where everybody, there's not many of us left, but how many of you are like me, and I consider myself normal, right? Because when, however we do things, we think that's normal. Like, I don't know if that's just you, but, you know, but how many of you are like post-Thanksgiving Christmas music people? Yeah, it's kind of a majority. That's the normal people. Right? Because, because in that, you know, for me, I don't want to rush a holiday. Like there is no reason to rush by the goodness and the greatness that is Thanksgiving. And, and let me tell you, I am not going to rush by Christmas and jump into New Year. No, no, no. I want to celebrate each one, soak everything I can get out of it, and then move on. But I do know there could be another group in here who looked at your calendar this morning and you're like, mm, December 17th, I might play Christmas music tomorrow. Are there, are there any of those who are like, not turned it on? I see you, I feel you, right, right? And, and you may never turn it on at all, right? But hey, we all love it on some level, right? And we all have, maybe, if you're like, I don't even know what my favorite song is, there's gotta be something you like. And for me, my favorite, when I look at the songs that I've listened to over and over, kind of diverse, but I really landed on Go Tell It on the Mountain by Need to Breathe. Like, I just keep playing it over and over, and I feel so Christmassy in my car all by myself, turned up as loud as my speakers will go, and I just love that song right now in this season. But there's the classics. We all love the classics. We sang two this morning. We'll sing some more next Sunday, right? I grew up listening to Silent Night and don't tell anybody, but like I like the Kenny G instrumental of Silent Night. Like I just am like, whew, it just soothes me. But then there's joy to the world. I mean, there's such hope in those lyrics. But then when we think about another great one, it's A Way in a Manger, right? In A Way in a Manger, that's the musical version of Luke chapter two, the Christmas story. And if you're kind of new to church or you, you hear people talk about the Christmas story, the Christmas story, and you're going, I'm not sure where the Christmas story is. Maybe your takeaway today is to go Luke chapter two. That is the Christmas story. And if you're like, but I'm not sure what that one says, just listen to the Charlie Brown Christmas special, right? When Linus comes on stage and he says, and he reads, the, goes through the Christmas story, and then he says, that's the real meaning of Christmas, Charlie Brown, right? That is the Luke chapter two Christmas story. And we're going to look at that some this morning. But when we look at a way in a manger, we look at these words, we, we see this, this peaceful, right? I mean, there's just such a calm that comes with these words. A way in a manger, no crib for a bed. Like we see that. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Like, and if, and if you're a parent, a grandparent, maybe you've had nieces and nephews that you've seen when they're newborn. I mean, there's just something about that. It's just like, oh, we just want to hold them. Just kind of rock them a little bit. The song goes on, you know, the stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus Right, I envision that six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus just lying there asleep on the hay. I mean, so precious, so calm. And, and for my family, growing up, the Christmas story is something we always read. It has been a part of, of Grisham Christmas tradition as long as I can remember. 
And whenever the, the, the grandchild was old enough to read, they were tapped on the shoulder to read the Christmas story. And you know, when I was young, I just saw it as a barrier to entry from getting to open up gifts. But the older I got, I realized this was such a peaceful moment. Uh, last weekend, two weekends ago now, um, we did the Grisham Christmas in Birmingham with all my family, my brothers and their wives and kids and all that. And, and Tripp, who is, who is uh, in the fifth grade, read the Christmas story. And in that moment, it was quiet. We were all pulling for him because there's some big words in there, right? Kind of make you nervous, kind of stress you. And he read the whole story. And then my dad prayed over all of us. It was like an amazing, peaceful little snippet of Christmas that I think we all want. We all want this peaceful Christmas. But I think our reality is we use the experience more stress and mess than we do peace and calm. I think of the first Christmas when Amy and I, we, we, we married, our, our oldest son had just been born. He wasn't even one yet. And we had to do the family Christmas drive around. We, we left from Atlanta, Georgia to Birmingham. That was leg one of the trip to do a Christmas. Then we went from Birmingham and I think we got up at 3 a.m. to drive to where I grew up, Athens, Tennessee, to do Christmas, not with just one grandparent, but both sets of grandparents. And don't get me wrong, I love family and we do family really well, but that caused incredible stress and there was a whole lot of mess that went on with that Christmas to the point like the whole family said not again not just me and Amy going we ain't doing it again but the whole family realized we cannot do Christmas this way there was way too much stress there was no peace there was no calm and how about your Christmas maybe right now you're going oh yeah I've got that drive ahead of me with the kids in the back seat Maybe it's two hours, three hours. Hopefully it's not like 10 hours. And if you've got that drive, bless you. <clears throat> Special prayers for you and your family during Christmas, right? And the kids are yelling, are we there yet? And do we get the gifts, right? That's a whole thing of stress. And then when you get there, you've got, you've got your wife's family, You've got your own family. You've got your, if, if your wife or your husband, if they have siblings, you've got to deal with them. And then you've got those kids who, if you're just honest, your kids are angels and their kids are a hot mess. Isn't that where we kind of tend to put the category? And then you've got blended families, extended families. And then there's this whole other side of Christmas that causes stress, which is where Amy and I are right now, is we don't have any of our kids here. So our stress is because of no family. It's kind of ironic, our stress started because of too much family. And now fast forward, our stress is because we don't have them here. But there's such stress that comes in to Christmas. And I think if we were intellectually honest, we, we would rewrite Away in a Manger and, and it would go like this. And I'm not gonna sing it because I've, I've told everybody, if all the singers are sick, we won't have singing because there's no way I will stand up here and sing on stage. But if you can hear the Away in the Manger theme, all right, the, the song to it, just kind of go with this. It would say, a long way to Bethlehem, Mary and Joe went for a census with donkey in tow. Mary was pregnant and Joseph did fret, should have booked on Airbnb, but I always forget. The inns were all full, not a room to be found, with everyone coming to their hometown, at least in a manger with animals and straw. They settled in snugly, in awe and in raw. That, that's more a realistic picture of what they experienced. And I think we all experience stress too. And, and I wonder if we create the lights and the gifts and the pretty bows and what we do on our houses and everything that goes around it to try to decrease that stress because we all want this peaceful Christmas and our, our traditions kind of move us that way. But we have stress in our lives that tie to Christmas where we wish there was fun and peace. Rather than experience a Christmas of peace, many times we experience a Christmas that's more like Chris mess. Now, here's the thing about this idea today is that it doesn't matter if you're a church attender. 
If you're a Jesus follower and you're saying, hey, I, I, I put my trust in Jesus 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, or today you're here, you're watching online and you're saying, I hear you continue to talk about this relationship with Jesus. And you would say, I've never really began that. Our hope is that one day you will because the incredible hope that comes with Jesus is amazing. But this idea, as we talk through today, this idea of Chris mess is a reality to each and every one of us. And, and no matter how hard we try, there are stresses that go with Christmas. So what we are going to do this morning is we're going to look at the Christmas story. We're going to look at Luke chapter 2, but I want us to look at it through a different filter. We're going to look at it through a filter that, that is this. Where was it a hot mess and where was there super stress? Right? Hot mess, super stress. Because I think when we look at that, the first Christmas was quite the Chris mess. And I think we're going to see that together. And my hope is that when we wrap up our time together, is that you see the Christmas story in a different way. Regardless of where you are on the continuum of a relationship with Jesus or no relationship with Jesus. But then I also hope that we will realize that the first Christmas, we can identify with it more than we think we can. So here we go. Luke chapter 2. Hot mess, super stress. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius, that was tough when I was seven and read the Christmas story. It's still a tough one to say right now. While Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town to register. Okay, you don't have to look far to realize that this census that went on caused an absolute hot mess for everyone around the other piece about this, something I kind of realized as I processed through the Christmas story to prepare for this morning, was that that census did not take place because Mary and Joseph were about to have a baby. That census just took place in history. And, and then everyone had to respond to it, and that caused Mary and Joseph to respond. But think about what went on in that census. This is the best example that I can give. When, when we moved here from Georgia and I had to transfer my Georgia driver's license to an Alabama driver's license, that experience was pretty much a hot mess and it caused me a lot of stress. Part of it was my own fault because I couldn't remember what documents to bring. But could you imagine traveling however far you had to travel to stand in an incredibly long line and there was no technology, no Wi-Fi, and they were manually writing down, okay, the Grishams, how many do you have? And you're here and you're here. And then you moved on your way. The stress and the mess that was started right out of the gate before we even get to Mary and Joseph was real. For us, things that we have no control of that just happen in life cause us stress and cause the season sometimes to be a mess. We read on. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Mothers in the room. I don't think I can give fair words to what it felt like to be a pregnant Mary. She was days from delivering. And she went on a four-day journey on a donkey or walking beside a donkey. I don't know how they traded that out, right? Could you imagine that journey and the stress that it put on not only Mary, but Joseph and the baby and the way they went getting to where they had to go. And as we read the Christmas story, I think sometimes we just kind of skip over all this. This is just like a detail, but realize the pressure and the stress and the worry that it put on their family. The story goes on. So while they were there, we kind of, you may know what happens. The time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in a cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Moms again. Uh, I mean, I, 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 when, when we had our boys, we had a rule. Only Amy and I could be in the room. No parents, no, no additional family, no nothing. We wanted the medical staff and as many of them as we could get. We were thankful for them. 
And I, I, I was a part of that experience just, you know, from afar. But moms, I could not imagine what young Mary delivering her first child experienced in the stable with a whole bunch of animals around, no doctor. Maybe there was another person they called out and said, has anybody ever delivered a baby? And somebody came over and gave her a hand. But the, the, the mess, literally, and the stress that went along with that, and then imagine... Imagine you've just delivered your first child, right? I mean, yes, it's the Messiah, the Savior of the world, but at the same time, this is Mary's firstborn that she carried and delivered. And as she sits there and rocks that baby and thinks, where am I going to put my baby? She looks and her best option is a manger, the mess the stress. They scoop out the animal feed and whatever slobber and nasty was in that thing. And they said, we've got a cloth. We're going to wrap them up. And this is the best we can do. And here you go. We sit you down. That, that is not what any of us would want for our kids and the stress and the mess that went with it. So we're going to give a pause to Mary and Joseph. Like they have enough stress going on right now in the story. And the story shifts to the shepherds. It tells us there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Okay, that causes stress. We're going to see about that in a second. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I, I think that pretty much explains itself what they were feeling in the moment. And when you think of the shepherds, the awesome part in this story is that they were the lowest of the low on the socioeconomic level. Nobody grew up saying, boy, if I could just be a shepherd one day, that would be the greatest. You kind of, they kind of ended up there. But this is where the story began, and this is where we enter into the mess. And here's what we learn about the shepherds, is that the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Anytime you see an interaction with an angel, the very first thing the angel says to people is, do not be afraid. You know why they say that? Because they're afraid. They know we just scared everything out of the person that we just interacted with, and they try to calm them. But here's what I love in the story, and it's true in our lives as well, right? We all have the mess. Sometimes we're a hot mess. We all have stress. Sometimes it's super stress, and we feel like we're so disconnected from everyone, everything, and even our Heavenly Father, but what I love in this story is that in the mess, as Mary and Joseph are sitting there dealing with everything in front of them, the angel says, I bring good news of great joy for all people. And in the middle of the mess, there's joy and great news. And the angel goes on to say, today in the town of David, a savior has been born. He is the Messiah the Lord, the chosen one, the promised one, the one that you've been looking for and looking for and waiting for. And they're here and this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So they took off. It says then, when the angel had left them and gone into heaven, okay, we, we read over that like that's no big deal. Was that like a poof and they were gone or they just like, they, like that whole thing right there would stress me out because I'm like, what just happened? But we just skip over that. When the angel had gone into heaven, it's like, oh, no big deal. The shepherd said to them, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. For a shepherd to let's go, like their whole job is the sheep. Right? And so they don't leave their livelihood behind. That means they, they gathered all the sheep and they said, all right, let's get moving. And they took every sheep they had because that's their job was to take care of the sheep. And they moved toward Bethlehem. And then the thing is, the only clue they were given was that they were going to find this babe in a manger wrapped in cloths. So, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who were lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. They found him. I don't know what that looking looked like. I don't know how long it took. I don't know what they did with the sheep, but they, had, they made it to Bethlehem, and they said, okay, let's find this babe. And then it's like shepherd and sheep visiting hour for Mary and Joseph. Just all of that is a lot. 
But what we tend to do is we tend to glamorize it. We tend to make it a masterpiece that looks something like this. The poinsettias, like they didn't have any poinsettias. The, no sheep act like that, right? They're like, hey, turn your head, look toward the little baby, right? The, the, the wrought iron or whatever that is back there, like we glamorize this thing Right? I mean, I, I do though for the dads, let me just speak to the dads. If you can see Joseph in this picture, this is Joseph back here, you can barely see him. But Joseph is on his knees like this. We can all identify with that because I don't know about you, but when, when I realized that Amy had just given birth to this, this thing, this little boy that was now mine, my immediate response was, dear God, please help me. So I think we can identify with Joseph as a dad, but I don't know about the other, right? But the first Christmas was anything but clean, neat, and tidy. The first Christmas was an absolute mess. When we look at, when we look at this story, the question I wanna ask you is this, why, why? Why birth the Messiah in the middle of a mess? Why, why would they even do that? Why, why did God choose this? I mean, God is God and God can do whatever he wants to do and, and, and he has an ultimate plan. But I mean, God could have said, you know what? No census. Caesar Augustus, I know you're the emperor and like I know you rule over the whole Roman empire and all that deal, but hey, you know what? I'm gonna whoop, I'm gonna take that right out of your brain. No census. Or he could have said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna have Mary deliver early. When we look at what was prophesied, we know that that wasn't the case, but he could have, he could have, he could have changed the whole plan. Or when he got there, they could have said, hey, you know what? We just had a cancellation at the Bethlehem Motel 8 and you got a room. But he didn't. He let it all play out. And this was God's ultimate plan to play it all out. This is why the birth was the way it was. And I believe God allowed Jesus to enter into the mess because it represents something critical to our faith and our relationship with God. What it represents is the fact that God was not afraid to enter the mess. The Messiah, the Savior, entered the world into the mess in order for us to see that God is willing to enter into the mess. And Jesus is the Messiah of the mess. That's what he came for, us, the mess. And, but I think, I think for many of us, we tend to think that God is more in a line. God likes the clean people better God tends to show more favor on those who've already got their act together, figured it all out. You ever feel that way? Like it's not uncommon. You look at the, the Jewish nation that was waiting for Jesus to come. He, they were waiting for Jesus to come and to them, God is a good God. Right? And, and the only way that they can connect with a good God is to be good themselves. And the only way that they could be good was to keep track of all the laws, over 600 of them. And if they kept the laws, then they could be connected to this good God. But if they didn't keep the laws, then they had to go present a sacrifice in order to get reconnected to the good God. So for them, this whole idea of Jesus coming into the mess in a very ungodly way was very, very, very difficult for them to get their arms around. Have you ever felt that you were too much of a mess? Have you ever felt like there was a time 
When you would say because of what you had done or didn't do or should have done, that you feel so disconnected from God that you said there is no way I can even utter the smallest of prayer to him. I think we all feel that way. And, and I, think, I think what we do is because of that, it makes it difficult for us to reach out to our heavenly father. I, I think at times it makes us all feel a little nervous to come to God. But here's the great news. Jesus, his direct words tell us different. We feel that because we're human. We feel that because we can only think through our brain and our filter and, and, and what the knowledge God has given us, but it is not the truth. The world tells us that, but it is not the truth. And I love, I'm gonna show us two verses here that show us what Jesus said and how he views his purpose and how he views us. The first one is Luke chapter 19, verse 10. He says, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. The son of man, that's Jesus. What is he here for? One purpose, to seek and save the lost. And then I, I love John chapter three, verse 17. Here's what it says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Right, at times it feels like, it can feel like that God is looking at us and it's like, you're too much of a hot mess, you're too much in stress, you have too many issues, you're way not clean over there. But, but Jesus said, hey, I didn't come for any of that. He looks at all of us and says, I love you, I love you, I love you, 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 you. And through him, he says, through me, he is here to save each of us, to help us have that right standing, that relationship that you'll hear us talk about, that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, I came to offer that to you. See, what I love about God is that God is not afraid to show up in the mess. And you hear that, you can, you can think like 30,000 foot mess, like, or just the mess in Bethlehem. Yes, that too. But I think metaphorically to each of us, we, we are Bethlehem, the mess that was that first Christmas. That's each of our lives on an everyday basis. Or maybe I'm just talking about myself because I know it is for me. I'm guessing it might be for at least one or two of you. But I find myself to be a hot mess. And what God said is, I will enter into the mess. And he got even more specific. And he said, I will enter into all the messes. My mess, your mess, your mess, your mess, your mess, and your mess. He said, I will enter in. And he is not afraid to enter into the mess. See, what I love about the Christmas story, what I love about who God is, is that the glory of God began in a glorious mess. He entered into the world not as a king, not sitting on a throne, because see, what, what God knew in his perfect plan was that one day that whole thing of, of a Caesar being in place and, and, and a king being in place, he knew that model was gonna end. And he knew that for us, if, he, if Jesus came as this incredible king and, oh, and everything around him and all that, we would not identify with that. But see, what God knew is that he wanted to begin this in the glorious mess because all of us can identify with the mess because we're all kind of messy. And when we talk about the unexpected Christmas, it is the message of the manger. That was the unexpected Christmas. The message of the manger is this, that God doesn't mind a mess. And those who had been following Jesus, who had been following God and waiting for the Messiah to came, that is not what they expected. 
And I think if we all wrote the story of Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who, those of us who've who have a relationship with Jesus, we say we've given our whole life to that we plan on spending eternity with forever and ever, we would not have written a story that began in the mess. But we are all messy. And God said, I'm gonna send my son to meet you right in the mess. And the mess, the mess is the point of Christmas. The mess is the point of the Christmas story. And really, it's our mess that brought Jesus to this world. Because the thing is, you'll hear people say that Jesus is the reason for the season, right? There's the buttons and maybe a shirt. But I, I don't think that's all the way accurate. I mean, it's some accurate. But the reason for the season it's our mess. It's my mess. It's your mess. Because without the mess, there's no reason for Jesus to be here. Without our mess, there's no reason for him to come and be a part of this. Because what I love is that Jesus entered the world in a mess to save the world from a mess. And Jesus entered the world for my mess and your mess. So what about, what about as we count down the days for Christmas? What if we looked at our beautiful nativity scenes and we just kind of messed them up a little bit, right? Jesus is still the centerpiece of it, but we messed up what was around it. And we begin to think about and see differently that the mess of Christmas, our mess, is what brought Jesus to this earth for us. So this morning, I leave you with this. Merry Christmas. Let me pray for us. God, this morning, we thank you. God, there's so much. There's so much that you have done for each and every one of us, God. We thank you just that this Christmas story was captured in time, it made it through time, and that we today can read once again your story, the story of your son, and that we can remember that you sent your son because of the mess. God, I thank you that you're okay with my mess. God, in the moments where I struggle, God, in the moments where I actually pull away from you because of my mess, God, help me to remember that you are always there with me and that's where you do some of your best work is right in the middle of our messes. God, today, as we hear these words, help us to take them and apply them some way in our life. And God, if we run into that person this week who is just, you, we see the stress in their life. We see the mess that they're walking into and maybe they created it, God. Help us to have the courage to remind them that they can meet you right in the middle of the mess. God, thank you for sending your son and placing him in a manger. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.